Our reading comes from chapter 2 of Galatians, beginning at verse 11 to the end of the chapter. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is I who no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ had died for nothing. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we pray that your spirit would speak to us through your word today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I watched a very cute little series this past week on YouTube entitled Love in Lockdown. Some of you may have seen it. It's at six, roughly six minute episodes. Uh, and it's about a 30 something single girl who gets given a ukulele and six online ukulele lessons during the COVID-19 crisis. The idea is it will give her something to do. Sure enough, perhaps you guessed it, her online ukulele teacher turns out to be a 30 something single bloke. But we quickly learn that he's bohemian, she's organised. He's anxious, she's insecure. But after a slow start, the chemistry starts to happen. It's obvious that they both like each other. And as the story progresses, you see them sort of tentatively reaching out for the other, craving, hoping for acceptance by the other. And perhaps more than acceptance, love as well. You see, acceptance is very important to people. Perhaps you can think of a time when you started at a, a new school or in a new job or at university or something like that. You walked in the situ or into the situation and you thought, how do things work? What do I do? How do I get accepted? And perhaps you ended up being accepted, which was great, or perhaps you felt you never did, which would have been very hard. I'm very familiar with the idea of being accepted in sporting teams. And in the good old days when you joined a team, the idea was that you just kept very quiet and let your sport do the talking. When I was in year eight, I made our high school cricket team. And I was hanging out with guys a few years older than me, guys in years 10 and year 11, guys with deeper voices, guys who shaved, and I was very uh, nervous. I barely said boo to anyone, I desperately wanted to be accepted by my teammates. Now, why is it that acceptance is so important? Well, it's because relationships are so important. We want to be accepted into relationships by significant others, significant other people. You see, relationships are not just the spice of life, they pretty much are the core of life. 
Now, I don't know whether you noticed it or not, but today's reading from Galatians has a lot to do with acceptance. It talks about acceptance by God and the acceptance of others. Now, if you are someone who would like to be accepted by God, and if you're someone who'd like to know what God says about accepting others, today's passage is for you. We're continuing our series in the book of Galatians, our term two series, and we're up to chapter two, and we're looking at verses 11 to 21. The title is Acceptance That Matters, and uh, there's an outline which hopefully many of you will have out, uh, downloaded from the website. And firstly, we're going to think about one, what Peter did, two, what Paul did, three, what Jesus did, and finally, what will you do? So that's where we're going. Well, the passage opens with verse 11, and Paul writes, When Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Wow, that really is the clash of the titans, isn't it? Paul opposes Peter. It's a bit like a state of origin rugby game, you know, state against, state against state, mate against mate. Two apostles here in open conflict with each other. What on earth is going on? Well, it's all because of, here's our first point, what Peter did. Look at verse 12. For before certain men came from James... Now, James was Jesus' brother and one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Before certain men came from James, he, that's Peter, used to eat with the Gentiles. That's Christians from non-Jewish backgrounds. But when they, the men from James, arrived, he, Peter, began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles. Peter, it seemed, it's stopped eating with the Gentile Christians. Now, that is actually a bit more serious than you might initially realize. You see, in the ancient world, the eating of meals together was a significant sign of intimacy. And the church in Antioch was something of a, a, a groundbreaking group. Here we have Christians from a Jewish background and Christians from a Gentile background fellowshipping it together, eating together, being a church together. And this was not noteworthy because there was a very strong separatist tendency amongst many Jewish people. There was one Jewish writing of the period entitled Jubilees, or the Book of Jubilees, which says, separate yourselves from the Gentiles and do not eat with them. And this separatist idea was known amongst the Gentiles as well. They are the Roman historian Tacitus uh, writes of the Jewish people that they sit apart at meals. So, for Jewish believers, eating together with Gentile believers, as Peter had been doing, and as in fact God had authorised back in Acts chapter 10, made a very powerful statement to the world about Christian unity. But here, it seems that Peter is undoing all this good work by drawing back from his Gentile brothers and sisters. Now, why would Peter do that? Now, perhaps he had some sort of rationalisation for it. Perhaps it had been suggested to him that it would be easier for the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem if he, Peter, a prominent Jewish Christian, uh, drew back from Gentile believers. That might have made it easier for the Jewish Christians into Jerusalem. Well, maybe. But the passage tells us that the real driver for Peter's actions here is something else. The real driver here is fear. Look at verse 12 again. It says, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Now, this idea of fear driving people's behaviour is very common. It's very human and it can be very damaging. Some of us may remember when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989 and the great joy that was associated with that. It would have been unthinkable to then turn around and put the wall back up. 
The Christian church here has broken down the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles. What's Peter doing in putting it back up? He's delivering them really a real slap in the face. He doesn't accept them as he should. Now, Peter's actions here are a bit like the COVID-19 virus. Not only are they very damaging, but his actions are also highly infectious. You see, Peter is something of a role model or an influencer, we might say, it seems. You see, verse 13, we read that the other Jews joined Peter in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, the man whose name meant son of encouragement, even Barnabas was led astray. A good thing to ask ourselves is, does fear drive us towards bad behaviour? You see, the fear of someone or something may provoke us to lie. A parent may say to their kids, guys, have you, have you done your homework? And the kid says, yes, but it turns out they haven't. The fear of people can sometimes lead us to reject others. Uh, back in the 1980s, there was a movie which I quite liked at the time called The Breakfast Club. And it depicts five high school students who are placed on Saturday detention in the school library together. And these five students couldn't be more different. And two of them are as follows. One is a girl. She's a bit of a princess, a homecoming queen type. And one of the others is a guy, a very intelligent but fairly nerdy, spocky sort of bloke. And as the day unfolds, the five of them gradually become friends. And this nerdy guy becomes friendly with this, you know, prom queen, homecoming queen girl. But then as I recall it, near the end of the movie, the guy says to this very popular girl, look, you know, we've sort of become friends today, haven't we? What happens when we get to school on Monday? Will we be friends there? And the girl looks really awkward and uncomfortable. And the implication is, no, I, I really couldn't do that. You see, it seems that her fear of what other people will think will cause her to behave badly. And perhaps one of the worst examples of fear causing us to behave badly involves Peter himself once again. The night before Jesus' crucifixion, Peter denies knowing Jesus three times. And it was because of his fear of those he was with. So that's what Peter did. He withdrew from the Gentile believers somewhat. Well, let's see, point two, what Paul did. Verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that, that's Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a gentle and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. You see, Peter's, uh, I guess, withdrawal from the Gentile believers had been a highly public thing. So Paul confronts Peter publicly in relation to what was, in effect, a public sin. Now, do you think that Paul enjoyed doing that? The famous English preacher and commentator John Stott has some interesting words to say at this point. He says, Was it because that he, Paul, had an irascible disposition and could not control his temper or tongue? Was he an exhibitionist who enjoyed an argument? Did he regard Peter as a dangerous rival, so he leapt at the opportunity to down him? No, none of these base positions motivated Paul, says Stott. You see, Paul takes a stand because, as verse 14 says, the truth of the gospel, that's a quote, the truth of the gospel was at stake. Paul sees that Peter is not walking consistently with the truth of the gospel, a gospel he will go on to outline in verse 16. See, most of us dislike conflict with others, but there are times when we may need to take a stand over things. I don't think we need to take stands over things which are of minor importance or of moderate importance. 
in situations like that, it's good just to, I guess, sit down and discuss and work through things together, perhaps dis agree to disagree at the end. But we certainly need to make a stand when the greatest news in the world, the saving news of the gospel, starts to get contaminated or changed such that it's rendered ineffective. And this danger is there all the time. It was here in the early church. It was there around the time of the Reformation in the 1500s when Luther had to make a stand for a gospel or the gospel against seemingly the whole church or almost the whole church. And many take a stand today. In, in Africa, for example, many Christians take a stand for the true gospel against the false teaching of the prosperity gospel. This is the teaching which sort of says that if you become a Christian, God will make you materially rich. Now, God will make us rich spiritually, but there's no New Testament promise that God will make us materially rich if we become a Christian. It's false teaching. It's a false gospel. Yet, it's one that will be very attractive in Africa, given the number of people there who are poor. A stand often needs to be made. Well, then, so that we can be clear on the gospel, we then move on to the next point, point three, what Jesus did. And these next few verses really are something of what I might describe as a super passage. Some of you may be interested to know that amongst theologians, there is some discussion as to what was the centre or the heart of Paul's theology. Some say it's justification by faith. Others say it's the idea of union with Christ. But interestingly, in this passage, both those key ideas are discussed. See, in these next few verses, Paul seeks to explain succinctly and clearly how Christ saves us and then Christ transforms us. And both are by faith in Christ. Firstly, Jesus Christ saves us. Look at verse 16. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Did you notice that Paul in effect says that we're justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, three times in the one verse? See, the Bible makes it crystal clear that we're all guilty of sin, of wrongdoing, by our actions, by our words, and by our thoughts. We're all guilty. But it says here that we can be justified. To be justified means to be declared not guilty, to be treated as righteous. Now, how is it that we can be declared not guilty and treated as righteous? And now here we get to the really counterintuitive thing, the thing that most Australians don't understand. You see, most Australians would assume that we get right with God by earning it, by being good enough, by merit, by works. But the passage specifically says it's not by that, it's by faith in Christ, by trusting in Christ, by relying on what Christ has done, by receiving the benefits of Jesus's death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. It's by receiving this that we are made righteous, not by works of the law. The law here in this passage refers to the sum total of God's commands in the Old Testament. And the works of the law refers to acts done in obedience to these laws. Now, many Jewish people of that period presumably thought that they could be justified or rendered not guilty by sufficiently doing the works of the law, by working hard enough. But the New Testament makes clear, no one can be justified by striving under the works of the law. Now, as I said, this works uh, idea of how to get right with God is the way most people think in the world. Earning our way to God or to Nirvana or to some other goal uh, or whatever is desired, is the foundation of almost every religious system. But it's also the view of the person in the street. If we pull up our socks a bit harder and try a bit harder, um, we'll win our salvation. 
I'm currently watching a series on Netflix entitled The Good Place. It's, it's a comedy, it's quite funny, and it involves these humans who, who have died and uh, sort of periodically travel between the good place, an equivalent of heaven, and the bad place, which is the equivalent of hell. Now, I'm only at the beginning of season four at the moment, but it seems to me that the premise is that you get to the good place by being good enough. We learn over time that almost no one does get to the good place, but it's, it's, a, it's a works, it's a merit-based idea. Now, we will, all of us, one day stand before the judgment seat of God. Now, I actually think a little bit more about death these days than I used to. A few years got, ago, I got used to the idea of having lived statistically roughly half my life. I thought that when I was in my early 40s. Now that in, I'm in my early to mid 50s, I realise that I've probably lived around about two thirds of my life, statistically speaking. High school to me doesn't seem that long ago, but it was in fact 38 years ago. Now in 38 years time, I'll be 92 years old, but actually I'll probably be dead. <laughs> our, our future for all of us is in God's hands. And when we meet God, the big question is, will God accept us? Now, verse 16 says on three occasions that we can be justified, considered not guilty, considered righteous, by faith in Jesus Christ. And this means that we rely and receive the benefits of Jesus' death and resurrection. We say to Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me and offering to take my sins. Please forgive me for my sins. I now want to follow you. We receive it by faith, not by earning it. Now, not only does Christ save us and accept us, but the next verses speak about how Christ goes on to transform us. Look at verses 19 and 20. For through the law... I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we don't just become Christians and God says, well done, you're on your own. Uh, no, now we live for God. Christ lives in us. We live trusting Christ and Christ transforms us. John Stott says very helpfully about this passage of these verses. He gives us new desires for holiness, for God, for heaven. It's not that we cannot sin again. We can, but we don't want to. Everything is different now because we ourselves are different now. Can you relate to that desire to please God? to know God, to live in a good, godly way? I can, if we're Christians, we'll want that. We won't always do it, but it's what we essentially want. And where does that come from? It comes from the fact that Christ transforms us, that he is now living in us. We live by faith in Christ as we are united with Christ. Well, finally, our fourth point, in the light of all this, what will you do? We reflected at the start uh, of this passage about how important acceptance is to us. And the most important person to be accepted by is, of course, God, the God we will one day stand before. Now, uh, if you're watching this today, uh, not a believer, I I'm so pleased that you're watching this, but we shouldn't think that we should stand before God and say, we're good enough to be accepted by you, God, because none of us are good enough. We need to receive what Christ has done for us, thanking God for his death, his son's death for us on the cross, asking him to forgive us and saying we want to follow him. That's the way to acceptance with God, receiving what Christ has done, not by relying on what we can do. But if, thanks to God's grace and mercy... <laughs> We are saved, we have received that, we are accepted by God. The thing to do is to rely on it and uh, not fall into the, the old 
I hope I've been good enough trap that sometimes creeps into our thinking. So if we're accepted by God, firstly, we need to rely on it. But we also need to defend the gospel. See, the gospel was under attack in Paul's day and it's under attack today. People want to infect the gospel by adding additional works onto it. They might say, yes, to be saved, to be accepted by God, you need to uh, respond to the gospel, but you need to be fully immersed in baptism or you need to speak in tongues or you need to be a member of one specific denomination. No, we need to stick to the gospel, the news that Jesus' death and resurrection is ultimately the way whereby we can be accepted by God and forgiven. And of course, the third thing we need to do is to promote the gospel. And we so often talk about that here at this church. So that's how we can be accepted by God. But as people who are accepted by God, we need to accept other people, particularly those others who too have been accepted by God. So you look around at church or look around on your Zoom screens on your computers when we're at church and think of everyone you see that if God accepts them, we need to accept them too. If God accepts them, who are we to reject them? But this can be a problem for us often. Peter went wrong and we can go wrong as well. Perhaps you're at school uh, watching this and uh, Sometimes, thinking back to my school days, it's, it's often a common thing that if you go to one school, you sort of don't really accept people from another school. Or perhaps in your own school, you don't really accept people from a certain group of people in your school. Now, what happens if you're at church youth group or night church one night and someone from that other school or from that other group turns up at church? What are you going to do? Are you going to give them the cold shoulder, sort of reject them, or will you accept them? And then what if they become Christians? We, we need to accept them, don't we? Because if God accepts them, who are we not to accept them? But it's not just high schoolers who have this problem. We can all have this problem as well. As adults, we can be so non-accepting of other people. We give the cold shoulder to Christians who look a certain way or speak a certain way or act a certain way or who annoy us or who we might in our uncharitable moments think are a waste of space or whatever. Perhaps we fancy ourselves as someone who doesn't suffer fools gladly. What a horrible way of thinking. We need to accept others, particularly those who God accepts. In some parts of the world, people don't accept others on the basis of race. The great American evangelist Billy Graham took a stand against this and he repudiated racial segregation and insisted on racial integration for his crusades. And that is to his organisational team's great credit because insisting on racial integration would have been very unpopular with some people back in the 1950s and 60s in the United States. But if God accepts someone, who are we not to accept them? In fact, who are we not to accept anyone? Let me conclude. This passage I said at the start is all about acceptance. Acceptance that matters. And to be accepted by God is by justification, by faith in Christ, not by works. And when it comes to accepting others in the church, justification by faith in Christ is the only requirement for fellowship or acceptance. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you offer us acceptance through what Christ has done for us. And if we're accepted people, we pray that we would be accepting of others. Because if you accept others, who are we not to accept them? We pray that you would transform us to live by these truths. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.